Good morning. Thanks to Jay and Vicki for interpreting for us this morning. So I just got off the phone with the governor, as did Greg Kesterman. We'll, we'll get to that in a second. Uh, but we're going to run through the numbers first. Uh, with a precursor, um, the red tide of the virus continues to spread to every corner of Hamilton County. Not since the spring have we seen numbers like we are now experiencing. What's more, unless we dramatically change our behavior, those numbers are likely to increase. So let's talk about the numbers. So the number of positive cases of COVID-19 in Hamilton County as of today are at 17,719. The number of hospitalizations is at 1,300 and the number of deaths are at 344. The differences, those changes from last week, the increases, in positive cases, 1,485. In hospitalizations, it's 54. And in deaths, it's six. So as I report these out every week, I want to, I, I've been trying to, in my own mind, understand the dramatic nature of these increases. And I've been trying to figure out where is a, a flashpoint that really illustrates this increase that we've been talking about the last couple of weeks and the concern about this increase. So at the end of last month, the number of positive cases, that the change, the increase week over week was around 490 at the end of last month. The change at the end of this month is a thousand higher. It's about 1500. So that's the concern, is that in a month's time, the week over week increase in positive cases is a thousand. So some people have said, well, that's because we're doing more testing. We are doing more testing. Um, but that does not account for all of that increase, nor does it account for the increase in hospitalizations. So again, let's talk about that flashpoint. At the end of last month, the week-over-week week increase was about 16. Um, had, had fluctuated a little bit, but it was about 16. This month, that week-over-week week increase is 54. So again, you can see a fairly dramatic increase, especially if you're talking percentages. The death count uh, about a month ago was around 12 week-over-week week increase. As you just heard me say, we're down to six, but that's the lagging indicator. And so the expectation is that that number will continue to grow as these other two numbers continue to grow. So I just think it's helpful to every now and again just pause for a minute and step back and say, what are you talking about? What does this increase mean? And what really are these numbers? And so I hope that helps illuminate some of what Greg and I and others um, have been trying to illuminate over the last couple of weeks. So as act activities move indoors, we have to consider scaling back or eliminating some of the things that we all love, the family gatherings, watching the football games, I'm not going to call out any particular team, um, and Halloween events, which are, are coming up quickly. So as I said, we just got off a call with the governor. Um, he is doing calls with local communities, different counties that are in danger of going purple. Hamilton County is one of those counties. It's Clark County, Cuyahoga County, and Hamilton County. And so the idea is to bring people together and talk about what strategies we could implement to try to reduce this spread. And so there were a number of us on there. Of course, Greg Kesterman was on, uh, as were the other health commissioners in Hamilton County. Uh, Mayor Cranley was on, as were a couple of state representatives, uh, Bill Seitz and Cecil Thomas, and others, out, you know, leaders in outlying communities, some of the um, townships. And then um, health professionals, uh, Dr. Lofgren was on the call. Jill Meyer from the chamber was on the call. So you can, you can understand the collective nature of what he was trying to accomplish. And, I, and I'm grateful for that effort uh, because we are all in this together, as he has said many times. But some of the things that we talked about on the call were 
uh, the reasons for the spread and how we can talk differently or talk to different groups to try to tamp down the spread. And so Dr. Lofgren said something that I'm just going to uh, talk about very quickly um, that I thought was really important. He talked about how the behavior that we are seeing in this community is reflective of people expanding their bubbles. We all have our bubbles. You know, I've got my bubble with, with close family members, people that you live with. You know who your bubble is, uh, right? And we're all comfortable with our bubble. We know what behavior is going on with other people in our bubble, and we feel safe with those individuals because we're all doing, you know, wear, wearing a mask, washing our hands, staying away from people. Um, and so we've been all operating within these bubbles. People now have started to expand those bubbles to people that you know, you trust, you like, they're friends, they're family, but they haven't been in that immediate bubble where we were kind of all operating to begin with. And part of the danger is there, that we are um, with more people, we're exposed more often, and so much of the exposure is in people's homes. And then those people go to work or they go to the grocery store and they infect others. And that's what we think, and that's what the medical community, frankly, thinks is happening here. And Greg has been talking about this for a couple of weeks. So it's not only letting our guard down when we're out in public, which is happening in some areas, but really it's letting your guard down in your own home and not masking up in your own home because it feels weird. Um, but in some cases, if new people are being invited to that bubble, that's exactly what we have to do. Or stay away from these people, keep your distance, the six feet, um, or both, uh, which would be the safest of all. Because what we're doing on, our, on the private side is playing out on the public side. And that's why we've got an increased spread in Hamilton County. Um, so it's expected that Hamilton County may reach purple on the state's scale as soon as Thursday. We don't know that. As you know, we've got a bunch of indicators, and Greg will speak to this. Um, but if we are going on the same trajectory, we are likely to hit purple. Uh, and, and I've been asked many times, what does that mean? And I've said many times, it means whatever the governor says it means. Um, so right now, the um, purple indicates severe exposure and spread only leave home for supplies and services. That is straight off of the coronavirus web website at the state level, and that's what it means right now. Um, if the governor were to decide to take more dramatic action in purple counties, we would be impacted by that. That is not what we heard today, um, but I think these things are always subject to change, and so the idea is to tamp down the curve before we get to that point. Um, so we'll get to Greg in one second. But the other thing, big thing that's going on right now is voting. Um, I don't know if you realize that you can vote every day from now until Election Day uh, because the Board of Elections is now open on weekends. And so we've got a couple members of the Board of Elections, uh, Sherry Pollan, who's the director of the Hamilton County Board of Elections, and Sally Crissel, who is the deputy director of the Hamilton County Board of Elections. And they're going to give us an update on voting procedures um, and they're going to talk about voting options, what's available to people, and explain what to expect either at the polling place on Election Day or what you can expect if you go to vote early or um, vote by mail or drop your ballot in the drop box. And so um, one last thing before we get to all of that. So given our conversation today about voting, I have worn my um, vote earrings uh, these were given to me by Fiona Manders, who is a sixth grader at Hyde Park School. So uh, Fiona watches the briefings, and she sent these earrings last week. Thank you, Fiona. I will wear them with pride. Um, it's just a reminder that while we are in the middle of a pandemic, we also have a very important election coming up, and we all need to exercise our right, our privilege to vote. It's so important. So I don't know if you all can see them, but they're really cool. Thank you, Fiona. Um, so with that, I'm going to I hand it over to Health Commissioner Greg Kesterman. Thank you, Commissioner. So over the last seven days, we've continued to see an escalation of COVID-19 cases and hospitalizations for our region have continued to rise significantly. COVID is all around us and it does not show symptoms always. It is for this reason that we must all work together to help protect our families and to stop the spread of COVID. So 
Unfortunately, this message is so simple and it's the same, but we have to wear those masks and social distance. And I'm continuing to share that, and I'm hopeful that the severity of the amount of cases that we're seeing here, seeing here will help to continue to move people towards complying with this basic message. Um, I'll start today by talking about testing. We do have a ton of testing opportunities in Hamilton County. You can visit our website, which is hcph.org. All of the locations, including test and protect locations, are on our website. The test and protect team has been doing a marvelous job of looking at areas where there's less access to testing and setting up new sites. So please continue if you don't see locations near your home today, check back in a couple days. They've been constantly working to make sure that access is available for all of Hamilton County residents. When you get tested, if you're symptomatic or if you have had a known exposure to someone who has had COVID, you should quarantine at home until you get those test results back. This is important to slow the spread of COVID. Looking at our cases here in Hamilton County, for the last two weeks in a row, we've seen some of our worst days of COVID cases. This past weekend, we had 335 cases on Saturday and Sunday, which is definitely our worst weekend on record. A lot of activity for our contact tracers. Each one of those cases gets a phone call and we start doing contact tracing work to help continue to slow the spread of COVID within our community. On average over the last week, when you look at all of Hamilton County, including Springdale, Norwood, and Cincinnati, we had on average 210 cases per day. So that's a significant increase. The cases that we're seeing, they continue to come from our community and not just one source. There are certainly a couple locations where a few cases might pop up, but the majority of our cases are community spread. In the last seven days, all age groups saw an increase in the number of cases. The largest number of positive cases was the 18 to 29 year old age group with over 350 of those cases. Commissioner Driehaus shared we had 1500 cases in the last week. Unfortunately, there were also 200 new cases in the 70 to 90 age group. This increase is clearly our older demographic and much more sensitive to the, case, uh, to the COVID-19. And this might be a large part of why we're starting to see that transition into a higher number of hospitalizations. Very closely tied to our increases is our reproductive value. We're continuing to see our reproductive value for the last four weeks hover above one. Today's value is 1.17. And for the region, we are at 1.18. Our goal continues to need to be to get that number down below below one so we can start to see some shrink in the COVID activity here in our community. As mentioned, hospitalizations for Hamilton County residents have risen. Um, for our county, just our county, it's risen slightly. It's not nearly as sharp as when you look at the region. The graph on the left is just for Hamilton County. The graph on the right is pretty stark looking. It shows our regional hospitalization utilization. It includes a 14 county region listed on the slide. Over 250 patients with COVID are in our hospital systems right now. I shared a month ago about um, how we're doing in the hospital systems. I think it's worth reiterating our doctors have definitely gotten much better at treatment. While there's no one perfect solution for COVID, they have many more tools available now than when they first started trying to treat COVID in the early days of the pandemic. As a result, your time in the hospital if you get COVID is typically less. Early on, it was 10 to 12 days in the hospital. We're now closer to six days. So that's a great thing, and that helps our hospital systems with capacity a little bit. In addition, you're less likely to end up in the intensive care unit um, when we look at the early, early days in the pandemic. The next slide is a new slide that I put together. It shows the last 21 days worth of cases. You may recall that COVID-19, um, we are presuming, or we are considering people recovered after 21 days. So the last 21 days of cases, these are people that are still either sick or closer to recovery. There are three things that kind of jump out at me when I look at this map. First of all, in the last three weeks, we've had 3,896 cases of COVID-19. That's a lot of activity. It's very concerning to see that many cases in a community of our size. So really it's time once again to refocus our energies and to really work together as a team to do our part to slow the spread of COVID. Secondly, you can clearly see COVID is everywhere in our community. In the last 21 days, every jurisdiction within our community has had cases of COVID-19. But the last comment I'll make is you can clearly see much more darker shading indicating more cases 
on the western side of Hamilton County. So it's really just a, a reminder that we have to do our part. Those of us like myself that live on the west side, we need to work together, just like everyone in the county. But please remember, it's the time to act is now. We have to do this to get through um, to get through this fall. Looking at the Ohio Alert System, we are on the verge of becoming purple. Um, last week, we were designated as a county approaching level four. We had four, or I'm sorry, we had six of seven indicators flagged. While we, while several indicators continue to have some improvement, we are still very close to going purple. It's my hope that we've made enough improvement that tomorrow we won't be. But the truth is, it doesn't change anything. We have so much spread right now. We have to work together. We're hopeful that we as a community can make the necessary changes and as a team we can get through this and be a leader for the rest of the state. So we will all be watching closely tomorrow to see what the next steps are with regards to the Ohio Alert System. And then the final thing I'd like to cover, over the last week I've had a lot of questions about when people are required to quarantine and what is the difference between quarantine and isolation. So. First, I provide this slide to show um, a list of the symptoms. The symptoms on this slide are the symptoms that are listed by the Centers for Disease Control. They've been updated a couple times throughout the pandemic, but if you have any of those symptoms, the message has not changed. We are asking you to please keep sick at home. On the second slide, I've added names just so it's easier to follow individuals. If Sam becomes positive for COVID-19, anyone that is within six feet of Sam for 15 minutes has to quarantine. This would include on the slide both Mary and Julie. Sam, when he heads home, because he has a positive test, he is required to isolate. So the positive test is when the term becomes isolate for COVID-19. And you isolate for 10 days from the onset of symptoms or from your testing date. For his family, they are also considered close contacts or family contacts. Those individuals are required to quarantine, meaning they have to stay home for 14 days. It's recommended that when possible, they also social distance from Sam so that their quarantine, day, their quarantine time is not extended. Sam's parents will also get a letter saying that Sam has to isolate and they'll also get a letter saying they have to quarantine. I've had questions about that letter, people thinking that because they get a letter that they have to quarantine, that means they are a positive case or somebody took a sample on them. That quarantine letter just means you were close to someone that tested positive. On the next, or I'm sorry, and then looking at both Mary and Julie, they are both required to go home and quarantine as well. Remember, they were exposed to Sam but their families were not close to Sam. So their families are able to continue to go out and do their normal activities, whether it be go to school or work. So I've had a lot of questions about that as well. If somebody is quarantined in a home, not a positive case, you are still allowed to go out and do your activity. Additional temperature checking doesn't hurt. I would recommend that for everyone right now, especially as we approach purple. So on the next slide, if Mary becomes ill, so remember she was the close contact to Sam, if she becomes ill, we are then asking her family to quarantine and we're asking Mary to go get tested. So we now know that somebody who was close contact to a positive case has symptoms. The importance of this test on the next slide shows what happens then with her family. If Mary comes back negative, she needs to finish up her 14 day quarantine period but if she's negative, her family can once again go about their normal activities. However, if she's positive, then we will begin to isolate her family or quarantine her family um, so that they're not out there spreading this uh, COVID-19. So I wanted to share that it, it is a little confusing. This is some of the work that my contact tracers do every day. And I think um, it's important for everyone to understand how COVID-19 contact tracing, how the isolation and quarantine, how they differ. So anyway, in conclusion, as we move forward, the message is the same right now because of the new cases and activity. This message of mask wearing, keep sick at home, social distancing, we're asking that this message be amplified. We're at a critical moment. We have a choice. Do we want to continue down this path of seeing more cases, more hospitalizations and more death? Or do we want to work together? Wear that mask even in locations that you might not have considered wearing it in the past and let's get through this pandemic thank you thank you greg 
So now we are going to turn to voting. Um, so again, we've got the director and the de deputy director of the Board of Elections with us. So Sherry Poland and Sally Crystal are joining us virtually. Hello, ladies. Thank you for um, joining us. And so, uh, Sherry, I'm going to start with you. Um, and, t you know, it, talk to us about what we should expect here in the next week. Yes, well, good morning and want to thank you for inviting us uh, today to give an update to everyone on how we're doing with the election. Uh, what we can expect the next week is, um, well, we want to talk about three ways in, that voters have in Ohio to vote and the first by mail. And I want to mention that first because the window of time to select that as your option is, is dwindling. The uh, deadline to uh, return your application, completed application to the Board of Elections is noon this Saturday, October 31st. But we are urging voters to not wait until that deadline. We need to allow enough time for the process to occur. So if you are looking to vote by mail, um, get that application to the Board of Elections as soon as possible. The second option is early in-person voting at the Board of Elections, and we are breaking all records when it comes to in-person voting. Um, we have, as of end of day yesterday, over 57,000 voters have already voted in person. Our hours are 8 a.m. to 7 p.m., uh, Monday through Friday this week. Saturday, we're open 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Sunday, 1 p.m. to 5 p.m. And then early in-person voting ends on Monday with the hours of 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. The third option for voters to cast their ballot in this election is to vote at their polling place on election day. If that's an option voters are choosing, we of course recommend that they go to our website, votehamiltoncountyohio.gov and uh, make sure they know their polling location. They can utilize our Find Your Polling Location feature on our website there. We also, the Board of Elections sent a notice to every registered voter a couple of weeks ago, um, informing them of their polling place. Polls are open 6.30 a.m. Um, to 7.30 p.m. on election day. Also I'd like to talk a little bit about the safety measures um, regarding COVID that we are taking for in-person voting. Uh, what we're doing here during early in-person voting is the same as what our poll workers will be doing at the polling places on November 3rd. We're maintaining six foot social distancing. All of our poll workers um, wear masks. We have an extra supply of disposable masks, both here and at the polling places to offer voters who may forget their mask on election day. We have a large supply of hand sanitizer spread out the polling plate throughout the polling places. We also are designating some of our poll workers um, the duties of sanitation tech, and they will be sanitizing um, all the voting booths after, after each use. Uh, so we're taking a lot of precautions and uh, we're getting a lot of positive feedback from the voters, the 57,000 voters that have already voted in person. And you know we expect that conti to continue all the way through November 3rd. Sally, do you have anything you wanna like to add? Uh, no, I'd just like to say, I guess that we've had about, uh, we sent out about 180,000 absentee ballot applications. We have received 80% um, of those have been returned already, which is a, a great return rate. Reminding people if they have the ballot at home, uh, please return it as soon as possible. But with that, that figure, 180,000 voting absentee, with the 57 plus that are going to be voting here, early in person, we think this is going to cut down exposures and maybe lines on November 3rd. So just encouraging people to be safe when they go out to vote. Uh, we will have precautions at all the polling places. But if you want to bring your own pen, uh, wear your own mask, we would really appreciate it. We want to keep everybody safe and get everybody voted. Very good. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, I anecdotally have already voted. I voted early at the Board of Elections. and. I have heard nothing but accolades, uh, and my own experience was very positive. I stood outside for five minutes, got into the building, took another five minutes to get in the queue, get my ballot. Um, I did bring my own pen, um, so that was handy, uh, and then voted and dropped it in the box and got my sticker, and uh, the whole process was like 15 to 20 minutes, and it was very safe. People were very friendly. Um, I do want to note that wh how many polling booths do you have? So is it 120 inside the Board of Elections? Uh, yes, we have 30 check-in stations and then uh, we can go up to 160 actually, I believe, voting booths inside. 
All right, well, there, there it is. So, uh, yeah, it was very well done. Uh, people were so friendly. It, it was just a really positive experience. And I think that was universal from everybody that um, had come out, you know, kind of at this, around the same time. We were all wearing our masks, obviously, and we were distancing from one another as well. So thank you so much for um, just reminding us that we've got an election next week on Tuesday and reminding people uh, of how to do this and also uh, reminding folks that this is a two-step process you have to apply for um, the ballot uh, but you you've got to turn in the application for the ballot before you actually get the ballot so there is a time lag here and people need to do that sooner than later so so thanks so much for reminding um, all right so we are going to open up for questions I, I'm hopeful that the two of you can hang in there with us in case we have questions related to voting. And again, thanks for being here. Uh, usually they go to Greg, so I think you're going to be okay. Um, and bef well, let's, we're going to go to Jay Hanselman first today. Jay, I, I'm hoping you have a question uh, because as some of you may know, it's Jay's last well, it's his last week at WVXU. He is leaving on Friday for a different venture. And Jay has been a stalwart in the, the crew of folks that follow not only the county, but also the city. And so Jay, before you ask your question, and I'm obviously prompting you, um, but I, I do wanna say that we're gonna miss you. Thank you for your service to this community. Uh, you've been great to work with. You're always fair. You're always thoughtful about your reporting. So at the county, uh, we are going to declare Friday Jay Hanselman Day in all of Hamilton County uh, in your honor. So um, with that, Jay, I'm hoping that you have a question. I, <clears throat> I do have a question, and, and thank you very much for that honor. I, I appreciate that uh, greatly. I think I w uh, wasn't paying as close attention as I should have been when you were talking about your call with the governor. Did he give any more guidance at all what the status of changing to purple could mean, what that would look like, what could happen? I think the governor, along with the rest of us, is trying very hard to make sure that we do not have to take dramatic measures due to the increase of COVID-19. And so, as you know, going purple at this moment in time means what I read off earlier. Um, and it doesn't mean anything other than that until it does. And so the governor has the authority to say, you know, if you're a purple county, then X, Y, Z might happen. He has not done that. And my belief is that the reason he hasn't done that is because he is hopeful that we will message out to the community in a way that gets people to change their behavior and we don't meet all seven of those indicators that would tip us over into the purple. So he's had these uh, conversations with Clark County, Cuyahoga County, and Hamilton County because we're all the ones in red with a star. Means that we're at that tipping point. So I think, uh, and I, I don't mean to overstate it, but I think we're all desperately trying to not have us meet all these indicators and to tamp down this curve, keep people out of the hospital and eventually save lives uh, because that's what we're all trying to accomplish. So that was kind of the tone, the nature of the conversation today. Um, I will say it was a broad group of people that were on the call. All of us have been doing work, uh, particularly those over at the chamber who have joined us uh, in messaging out to the community in different parts of the community in different ways. So it was as much about how can we continue to work together to tamp down the curve as it was anything else. If I could just follow up on that, would the messaging be stronger, though, if people knew what X, Y, and Z were, that they knew that schools were going to close, they knew the businesses were going to be shut down again? Does that give a stronger message if they know if, if we don't do these things, here is exactly what's going to happen? Yeah, so that's not up to me, Jay. Uh, so I, I understand the question, but I have no authority over, you know, what the governor might do, obviously. Um, and it'll be up to him to decide when, if he changes what that designation means. Okay, thank you. Our next question is from Raven Richard from WCPO. Good morning. Hi, good morning. How are you guys? Uh, so quick question. Um, I know with all the cases we've been having, um, is this putting a strain on any of the contact tracers or do you guys need more contact tracers or what is this looking like? Certainly it is uh, the increased workload is 
creating um, a lot of stress for our team. It's putting our team kind of at the full capacity and we are hiring more individuals for contact tracing currently. I've shared many times on this briefing, um, I do have the additional capacity to bring in staff from our office. Many of them have been trained already to do contact tracing. We are not at that level yet. It is my goal to actually just use the contact tracer so everyone else can keep doing their other public health jobs. Okay, thank you. Our next question is from Christian Hauser from WKRC, and I think it's for Sally and Sherry. Good morning. Christian, you're Christian. muted. How's this? Can you hear me now? There we go. Yep. Sorry about that. Um, Sherry, I know that you all are aware of the, the alleged incident that happened with the sick couple as they were walking in to vote and, um, and some of the things said to them. I was just wondering where kind of you all stand in determining if, if you can actually find out if that happened. And the broader question is, you know, what, what should people do? Obviously, you have people waiting in line, you know, more so than ever before. What should they do if something like this alleged incident happens? Um, who should they turn to and what should they do to, um, to take care of that? Uh, yes. It, what they should do is report it to the Board of Elections. Uh, we have identified, um, our outside staff is identified by blue safety vests and they have Board of Elections photo um, ID badges that they're wearing. So if someone would come across a problem like that, um, that's what they need to do. They need to report it to the actual election officials so that we can investigate and um, take the appropriate action. As far as the incident that was alleged to have occurred on Monday, um, we are reviewing that. We have not received reports from any voters um, and no one who um, who has uh, alleged to have observed or witnessed this has contacted the board direct directly. Uh, so we're still uh, re reviewing the matter and, and looking to see if, if if it did occur and then we'll you know go from there. Thank you very much. Next, we have John London from News hey. 5. Hey, John. Hi, Denise. Uh, you and the mayor and the governor, all of you, Greg, all of you have been very strong on messaging. Um, uh, based on the numbers, uh, one could argue that it, it hasn't worked. Uh, we had uh, Greg tell us yesterday, uh, if the county goes purple, he hopes it'll shake some people up about the seriousness and they'll wear masks. Understanding that you don't decide this, uh, I'm sure you have an opinion about whether a mask mandate despite the enforcement problem, might be a stronger statement, certainly better than more messaging. Well, we talked a lot about messaging on the call today. We need people, not only ourselves, but others to join us in making sure people are aware of the danger of this pandemic. And so I, said to the governor, I think part of the challenge here is that we've got mixed messaging, that we've got folks that are saying things that are untrue, like masks don't matter, uh, masks don't keep people safe. And then we've got others like ourselves saying, the science would say that they do matter and they do keep people safe. And so, you know, it's part of the challenge um, no question about it. And, you know, what would be more effective is exactly what we talked about. Candidly, one thing we talked about was, you know, remember that there are 49 jurisdictions in Hamilton County, and the, the mayor and I have done a lot of public facing messaging uh, related to these jurisdictions. We have, and I, I'm on a call every week with the local electeds throughout the county. So the other 48, including the city, um, its administrators, its elected officials. And so we have been keeping people in the loop as far as the numbers and the trends and what's happening. I think we will likely ramp up some of the messaging out to the areas where we are seeing these increases. And Greg showed the map. 
you can see where the increases are. A lot of it is out in the suburban areas, and so we clearly need to do better out in these areas and make sure that they are keenly aware of the dangers of not taking some of these things seriously. And so that was, was part of the conversation today about how to ramp that up and do a better job there. Do you think the governor should institute a mask mandate uh, as, a, as a statement of the seriousness of this? I, you know, I hate to speak on behalf of the governor. We have, it, it's, it's tended to work in reverse where the governor uh, makes a decision or does a mandate and then we, because it's driven by science and, you know, the data that he has that I'm not privy to all that. Um, and then we follow suit here in Hamilton County. Now, Greg has shown you maps or charts where the mask mandate goes in place and we drop off, right? The, the cases drop off. That has become lax. People aren't doing it as much as they used to. And now we're back up. So, you know, I, I understand the question, but I, I'm not going to get in the shoes of the governor. The fact of the matter is we think everybody should be wearing a mask. Is there enough time, uh, Denise, do you think, based on the fact that you may go purple tomorrow, we don't know, but do you have enough time to get messaging out there to the suburban area and and make that effective well it, it's not as not like we're not trying right i mean here, here we are we do a weekly briefing um it is you know, open to everyone uh we are trying to message out i i think that from my point of view what i think is also important beyond just the message is the messenger and so I think we need to engage some of those local officials who know their communities well. These are, some of them are pretty small jurisdictions where people, you know, they, they all know one another and get some messengers out there that people might respond to differently and say, hey, we need your help messaging into the community. Maybe they're not watching the news. No offense, John, but maybe they're not watching the news. Maybe they're not listening to my briefings. You know, it, it is what it is, but we need to find a way to reach them to make sure they're hearing the same message. Thank you for all that. Uh, next question is from Chris Rhetoric from the Business Courier. Hey, Chris. Hey, good morning, Denise. Um, so who are you referring to a few minutes ago who, who was saying that masks don't work? Is that the president or someone else specifically or other people specifically within the county or the metro area? Well, I think we've all heard messaging from some of um, the federal level folks that clearly are not taking the masking as seriously as some of the rest of us. And so I think that creates a mixed message. There's no question about it. It creates a mixed message. And so people, I think, don't know how to respond to that um, or what to believe when, when you've got someone saying masks are not very important and they're not wearing them. Uh, and then locally we're saying they're tremendously important and we're wearing them all the time. Uh, so that's what I'm referring to. Um, I think it, clearly we've got folks in some of uh, Hamilton County that I, I, anecdotally I've heard a couple stories where people are not taking this seriously. Um, I don't, I don't know specifically who they're listening to. What I do know is that there is an opportunity to say we've got uh, elected officials or leaders, it doesn't have to always be an elected official, in some of these communities. Maybe we can utilize them in our messaging to do more spot on uh, because their behavior hasn't changed and they're putting uh, folks in danger in this community, not only themselves, their families, but all the rest of us as well. And then what do you, I mean, you said, obviously, the governor hasn't said what purple is going to mean other than the statement on the public health website. What do you think it should mean? What do you think as a leader in this community and as the president of the board of commissioners, what do you think should happen if this county goes purple? Well, the last thing we want to do is close schools and businesses. I mean, I joined the governor in this, this attitude that that's the last thing we want to do. And so the way to keep us from having to do it is to wear a mask. Uh, and, and we know this, right? So, you know, obviously that's an option uh, to make sure that everyone is wearing a mask all the time, especially on public. You know, Dr. Lofgren, I think it was Dr. Lofgren said today, um, as people gather inside, it's not only outside anymore. Uh, now people have to think about wearing a mask inside if they're not in that small bubble of people um, 
you know, that they live with. Uh, and so that's, that's and, and obviously we're not going to police that, uh, but, but we do need to encourage it and get people to, I think it's, uh, sometimes it's just a matter of getting people to think differently about what they're already doing and see the danger in what they're already doing. I, I think that mindset needs to be shifted uh, for all of us in Hamilton County. I mean, do we not already basically have a mask mandate? I mean, what what, what are where's the, the the daylight there? Where I think where we do, but but I think the idea today that was raised and it was an interesting concept is that while we have a mask mandate, um, as you go into certain businesses and you travel around out in public, the idea would be that's not enough because people are gathering inside, and and it's not yeah. a mandate. I mean, I'm not gonna. And, nor I think that anybody would suggest we should mandate masks inside. But the fact of the matter is that creates a safer space for everybody. And so we need to get people to think differently about that, to change their behaviors, uh, both outside and inside. Okay, thank you. Chris. Greg, do you have any further comment on the ma this mask wearing idea? And Yeah, I'll let you eliminate. Just to further reiterate it, I mean, we know that masks work and we know that when individuals are gathering inside of homes for movie nights or pumpkin carving parties or these activities that we're all trying to get back to a, a new normal, we're letting these friends and folks into our homes that aren't part of those circles. We could maybe open up a little bit more if we're opening up and doing one or two families pumpkin carving with a mask on. It's just this whole concept of, um, tired of COVID-19 and just kind of giving up and just getting back to normal. It just doesn't work. It causes a spread to uh, escalate at a rate that we haven't yet seen throughout the pandemic. That's all the questions we have today. All right. Thank you. All. And thank you again to Sally and to Sherry, who I think are still on the line. Thanks, as always, to Greg. And thanks to Fiona uh, for lending a bright spot to our briefing. Uh, remember to vote, everybody. It's next Tuesday, uh, really any day, uh, including next Tuesday. Please go vote. Um, it's so important. And we, we will be back next Wednesday. It's the day after Election Day. I think uh, Greg and I will be providing an update. It'll be fairly abbreviated because we will, a lot will be happening at that time, uh, but we will be here next Wednesday. So thank you all for joining.